Well, good morning. It is, it is my privilege, my joy to be with you and share God's word with you today. I certainly don't feel worthy of this great honor, but uh, by the grace of Jesus, I will do my best to share his word with you. I get to complete the series, Man's Darkest Night. Man's Darkest Night. And if you have been following along in this series, in the, the book of Luke, you know this night was indeed dark. Many of you have had dark nights of your own, and we get to look in and see where the hope for our dark nights lies. Before I read our text, I have a question for you that I want you to be pondering as we open God's Word together. And that question is this. Is He worthy? Is He worthy? Is Jesus worthy? Now you might be thinking, of course. Of course He's worthy. We know that. But just think. Think before you answer that question. Is He worthy? Do I declare with my life, with my actions, with the decisions I make, with the convictions I hold, that he is worthy? Is he worthy of you? Is he worthy of all blessing, honor, glory, and power? Is he worthy of your trust? Is he worthy of your life? We're going to see someone who before this night would have absolutely said, beyond a shadow of a doubt, he is worthy. We know Peter would have said that. But when the chips were down, when life got hard, when, when he had to make a decision to declare with his actions and with his words he is worthy, he had a different answer. So please, if you would, stand with me as I read... Luke chapter 22, 54 through 62. Then they seized him, that is Jesus, and led him away, bringing him into the high priest's house. And Peter was following at a distance. And when they had kindled a fire in the middle of the courtyard and sat down together, Peter sat among them. Then a servant girl, seeing him as he sat in the light, looked closely at him and said, This man also was with him. But he denied it, saying, Woman, I do not know him. And a little later, someone else saw him and said, You are one of them. But Peter said, Man, I am not. And after an interval of about an hour, still another insisted, saying, Certainly this man also was with him, for he too is a Galilean. But Peter said, Man, I do not know What you are talking about. And immediately, while he was still speaking, the rooster crowed. And the Lord turned and he looked at Peter. And Peter remembered the saying of the Lord, how he had said to him, Before the rooster crows, today you will deny me three times. And he went out and wept bitterly. May those who have ears to hear, hear the words that God has spoken to us. You may be seated. We see, if you've been following along in this series, we see the culmination of this night. As Jesus is led to his trial, this kangaroo court, where no justice was going to be meted out, at least not human justice, but it was the process of God's justice being poured out on the Son of God for us. But during this trial that was up front and center on the side of this trial of Jesus was a a separate trial, a sub-trial, a trial that Peter was going to be put through. Not a formal trial, not one with a judge and a jury set up, but one That was a trial nonetheless. A trial before a small group of people. A trial before a young girl. If we've been following along, you know that 
Satan had entered into Judas. Judas, the one who would betray Jesus to the authorities and ultimately to his arrest and his execution. And Jesus, knowing all of this, declared at the Last Supper that one of them, the one who would betray them, was sitting at the table with them. And of course, they all wonder, who is it going to be? Who is it going to be? Who is the one that would betray them? And quickly, this dissolves into a dispute among, among them. Who is the greatest? Of all of us sitting here, us, us 12 special men whom Jesus has called to himself, which one of us will be the greatest in the kingdom? They had this idea that the kingdom was coming very soon, and they were excited. They had great hope. They had just seen Jesus ride into Jerusalem to the cheers of the crowds. The people crying, Hosanna, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. That prophecy from that the king would come in lowly on a donkey. They had this feeling that the kingdom was near and they were excited. And in their excitement, they begin to discuss among themselves, who's the greatest? Now it goes without saying, Peter... I mean, he was a close companion of the Lord. He had his name in the, in the race, right? He had, like, listen, don't you understand? I'm Peter. I'm, I've led you guys all the way through this. I'm the one who always speaks up. I'm the greatest. And what does Jesus say? Simon, Simon. He doesn't call out all the other disciples. He calls out Simon. Simon, Satan, Simon, behold, Satan demanded to have you, that he might sift you like wheat. But I have prayed for you, that your faith may not fail. And when you have turned again, strengthen your brothers. And Peter said to him, Lord, I am ready to go with you, both to prison and to death. And Jesus had said to him, I tell you, Peter, the rooster will not crow this day until you deny me three times that you know me. In other Gospels, it's recorded that Peter says, Never, Lord, I am ready to go with you to the death. To the death. And he, and he, he denies Jesus' statement. He's like, there's no way I would deny you, Lord. Of course, Jesus knows. Jesus knows. See, Peter was a very, very proud person. He was always willing to speak up, whether or not he was wrong or right. He was willing to blast out. You remember when Jesus asked his disciples, who do men say that I am? Who do men say that I am? And they say, some say you're John the Baptist, some say you're that prophet. They had different responses, but Peter, when Jesus said, who do you say that I am? Peter, in a burst of inspiration, says, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. And then shortly after, it's recorded that, Peter, that Jesus says to him, you will be called Peter. And you know what Peter means? The stone. The stone. And Jesus says, on this rock, I will build my church. This declaration that I am the Christ, the Son of the living God, I will build my church on this. You, Peter, little rock. Now listen, as we come to our text today, Peter, I mean, come on, men, young men, even old men, how would you like, like, The Rock? That is a pretty cool nickname, right? You feel pretty manly with a nickname like that. That guy is The Rock. He stands firm. He will not be moved. He will not be shaken. This guy. Peter knew that. That was his name. But listen, then they seized him, Jesus, and led him away, bringing him into the high priest's house. And the little rock was following at a distance. And when they kindled a fire in the middle of the courtyard and sat down, the little rock sat down among them. Then the servant girl, seeing him, as he sat in the light and looking closely at him, said, This little rock, this man, also was with him. He didn't live up to his name, did he? No, he didn't. Why? Why was he so certain just a few hours before that he would follow the Lord, even if it meant death? 
Even if it meant that Peter had to go be nailed up on a cross. Why was he not willing to stand before a young girl and profess his faith? Could it be his pride? Can that not be our first culprit? As Peter is asked the question, is he worthy? His pride prevents him from having the proper response. Am I right? This little rock. As he's led into the courtyard, we see this picture, right? The commotion is up in front. The crowd is up in front. They're carrying this famous teacher who they were finally have captured and they finally put on trial. Over and over again, we see that the religious leaders had tried to lay hands on Jesus and arrest him, but they always were unable to do so until now. So they are excited and they're marching up ahead to the high priest's house to put him on trial and finally have their way with him. And along behind follows Peter. In the dark, in the shadows. He still has some level of loyalty to his Lord, some level of curiosity and fear what is going to happen to our leader. And he follows along behind. And while Jesus is up front being tried, Peter is back in the courtyard, just, just watching from a distance. And they light a fire to light up this dark night. And it's almost as if this fire, it's almost as if Luke is saying, when the fire is lit, Peter's trial has really begun. Peter will talk about, do not be surprised. In in, in 1 Peter, later on in his life, he's going to be, "Don't, don't be surprised when fiery trials come your way. And it's almost like, it's hearkening back to this night. That night when Peter was on trial himself. And he failed because of his pride. You see, Jesus had warned him. And even in Jesus' warning, he had given Peter a roadmap, a playbook, a way to see how he might succeed. Because he had said, Simon, Simon, humble yourself almost. Do you have any level of humility, Simon? Satan has demanded to sift you like wheat. Simon, you know what Satan did to Job. You know what Satan can do to you. Humble yourself. Humble yourself. But Jesus says, but I have prayed for you, and I know you're going to fail. I have prayed for you, Jesus says. And even though... Peter continued to deny it in his pride. Jesus prayed for him. And he brings him along to the Mount of Olives, that garden of Jesus' agony. And he says to him and to the other disciples, what? Pray that you may not enter into temptation. It's like Jesus knows what he's talking about. Jesus knows what is coming. Pray that you may not enter into temptation. And then he goes away, right? We know what happens. He goes away. Jesus is praying. He's agonizing to the Father. He sees the cup of wrath he's going to drink. And he comes back to his closest companions, Peter, James, and John. And what does he find? He finds them sleeping. Sleeping, just like I would be sleeping. In the garden, Peter says, Lord, you're not worthy of me to stay up just a few hours with you and pray. You're not worthy of that, Lord. He doesn't say it with his words, but he says it with his actions. He's sleeping. And Jesus comes back again and says, pray that you may not enter into temptation. And over and over again, these disciples fail to do so. And now the trial is here, and Peter is ill-prepared to face it. You see, many of us, it's, it's human nature, we have conviction, we have our plans, we have what we know we want to happen, we know what we want to do, 
And yet when the time of testing comes, we fail. You've all taken tests in school, right? And many of you get to the test day, and the test is in front of you, and you don't know the answers, and you you say, oh boy, I wish I had prepared for this. But it's too late. It's too late. Back in the States, I'm a basketball coach, and I know basketball is not common here, but that's what I coach. And so I'll try to make this picture clear for you. This was a big game. Our team was playing, and the score was tied. It was even. And the other team had the ball with 10 seconds left to score. And there was a timeout, so the coaches can talk to the players. And their, their, the other team's coaches are talking to their players, and our, our coaches are talking to our players. And their team had one chance to score to win the game. And our team had one chance to stop them from scoring. And we said, all right, this is, the, this is the way we're going to defend them. And we know you're going to stop them because that's what we do. We're going to stop them. But then one last time I said to them, we must control the miss. We must control the ball. And they all said, yes, we'll do that. We'll do that. We'll do that. Okay. So the game resumes. Ten seconds, nine seconds, eight seconds. And the clock is going down, down, down. And their player shoots the ball, and we all look up as the ball rolls around the rim and falls off. And our guys are happy, but their guy controls the ball and throws it in and wins the game. And we lose. You see, all of our guys had said, we will do the right thing. We know what to do. We know what to do. We know what to do. But when the moment came, the moment of temptation came, they did what they had prepared themselves to do. Because we don't just decide to do the right thing often in the moment. We decide in what we prepare our minds to do, leading up to that moment of temptation. The way we set our minds, the things we think about, will often lead to success or failure. The things we pray about. If we are in God's Word Filling our minds with his word. It's going to shape the way we think. Just like an athlete shapes the way his body moves by training his muscles, so a Christian trains their minds by focusing on the truth of God's word. And just like an athlete prepares for a competition, so a Christian prepares for temptation through prayer. In fact, years down the years down the road, Peter Peter is going to write a letter to Christians. And he says this in, in chapter one of First Peter, verse thirteen, he says, Therefore, preparing your minds for action, being sober minded, set your hope fully on the grace that will be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. This this moment, this young man Peter was not ready. But old Peter, he knew a thing or two. Listen, young men, young women. Those who have lived life and been through trials and made mistakes have some wisdom to share with you. And Peter has wisdom. Prepare your minds for action. Peter did not prepare his mind for action. Why? Because he thought there was no possibility that he could fail. He trusted in his strength, not in the strength of his Savior. And so he was ill-prepared for the trial that would come before him. Far too often that describes me and you. We are not filling our minds. We are not being sober-minded, ready for action. We're not ready to give a response for the hope that is in us. And so Peter stands before this little girl. Little stone stands before little girl. And he quakes with fear and says, I do not know that man. I don't even know him. So we see Peter's pride. 
leads to him being ill-prepared to face the trial ahead. And then we see his failure. Simon, Simon, behold, Satan demanded to have you that he might sift you like wheat. You see, with Judas, Satan enters into Judas and has his way with Judas. But we don't see that Satan is able to enter into Peter. The Lord had prayed for him, and yet, and yet Peter is still unable to succeed. We see later on, again in 1 Peter, we see that Peter had learned his lesson, and he he says to them, he says, be watchful, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, prowls like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. I'm get, you guys are all in Africa, so you probably have seen lions maybe in a lion park or something like that. We don't get to see them very often, and they're terrifying. Before we took the team back on Thursday, we went to, uh, where is that, Kroonstad, and there's a, there's a lion park there with many lions, tigers, other big cats. And you see them in documentaries, and they look Scary. But when you see them this far away with a little fence between you, that's something very different. As we're walking along the the cage, one of the lions is not afraid at all. And the, the, the roar is terrifying. The person next to me, when that, that lion unexpectedly roared at us, jumped into my arms. And I don't know, I wasn't watching myself, but I probably jumped into somebody else's arms because it was terrifying. The devil is a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. He is demanded to sift Simon. And Simon wasn't prepared. He was was not taking this seriously. Another thing our team was able to do, we went uh, to Polanisburg. And as we're driving through the park, looking for animals to see, we go through a bump, a real deep puddle that knocked our spare tire off. And so I said, I'll go out and fetch it and get it sorted out. So I open the door, and of course... The whole point of this park is wild animals. And so, my brother Lewis, he knows this. He's sober-minded. He's vigilant. So he says, whoa, 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 whoa. Look around. We've got to make sure there's not a lion off in the brush ready to jump on you. I was not prepared. I was not being sober-minded. We have an enemy. Yet we all walk around as if we don't. We live our lives as if we don't have an enemy. And we do. And he's here looking for whom he may devour. Looking for whom he may devour. So we continue on with Peter. Then the servant girl, seeing him as he sat in the light and looking closely at him, said, Man, this man was also with him. But he denied it saying, Woman, I do not know him. And a little later, someone else saw him and said, You also are one of them. But Peter said, Man, I am not. And after an interval of about an hour, still another insisted, saying, Certainly this man also is with him, for he too is a Galilean. But Peter said, Man, I do not know what you are talking about. And immediately... While he was still speaking, the rooster crowed. And the Lord turned and looked at Peter. And Peter remembered the saying of the Lord, how he had said to him, Before the rooster crows today, you will deny me three times. And he went out and wept bitterly. Do you ever wonder what that look was? Do you ever wonder that look that the Lord shared with Peter? When Peter fails his Lord, was it a look of utter grief 
as our Savior is being questioned by these criminals? Was, was his heart broken that his friend, his best friend, had betrayed him? Was it the look of, how could you? Maybe it was a look of humor, even in Jesus' dark moment. Maybe it was a look of, I told you so. You thought you would succeed. And yet you failed. I told you so. I'm right, Peter. Probably not. I think it was a look of compassion. A look of compassion knowing Peter's failure and his brokenness and the sin that had led Jesus to do this very thing that he was about to do. This weeping on the inside. Not not that he was harmed, but that Peter in his love, in the Savior's love, even in his darkest hour, he can look with love and compassion on those who fail him. And I need that. Because over and over again, the Savior must look at me with compassion and say, why'd you do that? You know that doesn't lead to joy. You know that doesn't lead to good leads to pain. Our Savior knows. And he looks down in our failure. He looks at us. And he looks at us with forgiveness. Jesus had predicted this, right? He knew that before the rooster crowed, Peter would deny him three times. But he also knew that he had prayed for him. And he also knew that Peter would repent. He says, And when you have turned again, strengthen your brothers. Strengthen your brothers. And after that look, after Peter has realized his utter failure, he turns, he goes out, and he is grieved. He is broken by his sin. Now, let's compare Judas and Peter. Judas betrays our Lord. And he is grieved later. And he goes and he throws the money bag back at those who had given it to him. They said, we don't want to touch it. That's blood money. Hypocrites. To the end. And Judas goes out and kills himself. And Peter, after he's essentially done the same thing, he, he's denied the Lord, goes out and is grieved. What is the difference between the two? Well, for one, Peter had a godly sorrow that would ultimately lead to repentance. I think Peter was disappointed, not because he had just failed, but because of the pain he is causing our Lord. Judas was disappointed because he was only about himself. And he realized he'd made a bad bet. Judas wasn't about the Lord, he was about himself. That's one difference. Another difference is, Jesus had prayed for Simon. He had not prayed for Judas. He had not prayed for him. Because Judas was the son of perdition pre- prepared for this moment. Prepared. And he was blinded in his sin. And he died in his sin. And yet, Peter, even in his grief, he did not repent right away, did he? He was grieved, he walked away, but he did not repent. Because what would repentance look like? It would look like him turning around, walking back in there and saying, I do know that man. He's Jesus. He's the Son of God. He's the Christ. 
And we should worship him. And you can do what you want with me. That's what repentance would have looked like. Peter didn't repent right away, but he began that process of repentance. And one day, he would demonstrate that his heart truly was in repentance. Let's show you. Acts chapter 4. Acts chapter 4 says this. Peter, this is after Jesus has risen from the dead. Peter is preaching in Jerusalem. Acts chapter 4, verse 5. And on that next day, the the rulers and elders and scribes gathered together in Jerusalem. And Annas, the high priest, the same one, Annas, the high priest, and Caiaphas, the same ones who had put Jesus on trial, and John and Alexander, and all who were of the high priestly family. And when they had set them in their midst, they inquired by what power or what name they did this. Then Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, said to them, Rulers of the people and elders, if we are being examined today concerning a good deed done to a crippled man, by what means this man has been healed, let it be known to all of you and to all the people of Israel, and by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, whom God raised from the dead, by him this man is standing before you well. And this Jesus is the stone which was rejected by you, the builders, which has become the cornerstone. And there is salvation in no one else. And there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. Can you imagine if Peter had said that to that crowd around the fire that night? This is Jesus. There is no other name under heaven by which you must be saved he would have likely been led to the cross with Jesus. But he would not have failed. And then later on, the chief priests and and those who were trying them charged them saying, you shall not preach or teach in this name. And what does Peter say? He says, whether it is right in the sight of God to listen to you rather than to God, you must judge. For we cannot but speak of what we have seen and heard. We must obey God rather than men. What a difference. What a difference. But what is the difference? Why is Peter, little rock, now willing to stand up and be identified with the cornerstone. What had changed? Well, one big change is this. Jesus had risen from the dead. That's a game changer, is it not? In this dark night, Peter is unable to see the truth of Jesus' resurrection that he had predicted. And he is fearful. And he is afraid. In this moment, Jesus was not worthy to him. But after he sees the resurrected Lord, and he is restored three times, right? The book of John records this. After he meets Jesus, the resurrected Lord, Jesus says to him, Do you love me, Simon? Yes, Lord, you know I love you. Feed my sheep. Simon, do you love me? Yes, Lord, you know I love you. Feed my sheep. Simon, do you love me? Yes, Lord, I love you. Feed my sheep. Jesus, restore Simon. That's the difference. And now Simon filled with the Holy Spirit, is willing to speak the truth. He's been humbled. He's repentant. He has turned away from his sin. And he realizes his only hope is in Jesus. There is no other name under heaven by which one must be saved. What good news. And what does that have for us? What is that for us? Who are we now? Peter, the little stone, 
his identity, right? He's now identified with the cornerstone. Jesus, that stone which the builders rejected. But he also writes. He writes his letter to the the dispersed Christians who are suffering persecution. He says, do you know what your purpose is? Your purpose now that we have seen the risen Lord. We find it in 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 4 and 6. It says this, As you come to him, a living stone, rejected by men, but in the sight of God, chosen and precious, you yourselves, like living stones, are being built up as a spiritual house, to be a holy priesthood, to offer spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. For it stands in Scripture, Behold, I am laying in Zion a stone, a cornerstone, chosen and precious, and whoever believes in him will not be put to shame. Man, Peter, in his trial, he fails it. He fails it utterly. But Jesus, the only man who matters, he succeeded in his trial. He stood before them innocent, and yet he is judged as guilty. Peter was guilty, but he got away. And Jesus stands and takes the punishment, as he does for each one of us. Because I'm guilty. If I had stood at that fire that night, I would have denied our Lord, I'm sure of it. Without the power of God in me, I would have denied our Lord. But by his power, we, by his power that he won for us, we can stand up and proclaim his name. Because he is worthy. And afterwards, after Peter had repented, after Peter had walked away, after he had seen this trial, he failed his trial, but Jesus succeeds. And he says, he is worthy. And then ultimately, church history tells us that Peter would one day go with the Lord to the cross. He spent his life serving the church and proclaiming the good news that there is no other name under heaven by which we must be saved. And one day, he was called before the authorities. And he did not escape. He did not escape with his body. But because of Jesus, he escaped with his soul. And he says to them, you can crucify me, but I'm not worthy to be crucified in the same way as my Lord. Crucify me upside down. And so they did. You see, Peter's story here is a story of failure, but it's a story of success of Jesus. It's our failure, Jesus' success. That is the story of all humankind. Adam's failure, Jesus' success. Abraham's failure, Jesus' success. And all the failures of all mankind from the beginning to now are laid on Jesus. And he receives the punishment for them and we receive his righteousness. And that that is the arc of Peter's life. It's not a story of, of Peter's like, well, one day he overcame. Well, no, one day Jesus overcame. And now Peter is radically different. And so for us, we are called to be sober minded, to be vigilant, because our adversary, the devil, roars like a lion, and he's seeking whom he may devour. And yet when we fail, we have an advocate before the Father. And if we would look at his face, we would call on him, we confess our sins. He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins. And we can declare he is worthy to receive all glory, honor, and power. And one day we will stand before the throne of God for those who have placed their faith and trust in him. In joy they will cry, he is worthy. And for those who have rejected him, they will cry, he is worthy, as they are damned to hell. Don't let that be you. 
Don't reject the word you are hearing today, the word you hear every time you come to this church. Don't reject it. Don't be like Judas who had lived his whole life or he'd, he'd, he'd walk through the ministry with Jesus, seeing miracles over and over again, hearing the truth over and over again, seeing who Jesus was and rejecting it. Receive Jesus for who he is, for he is worthy. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we love you and we thank you. You are worthy. I am not worthy. Lord, the only way I can stand up here is because of your grace. And I pray that the words that were spoken today, though I'm sure inadequate in so many ways, Lord, would your Holy Spirit take these words and apply them to the hearts and lives of these people here. I pray that they would have ears to hear, eyes to see, and hearts to receive the truth. Lord, you are worthy. As we sing today, would, we, would our hearts be singing along with our mouths that you are worthy? As we go out and live our lives, would our actions and our hearts declare you are worthy? And Lord, when we fail to live up to that, as we will, thank you for looking at us in our need and loving us and restoring us. Lord, would we not run from you and simply be grieved. But Lord, would we run to you in our grief? And would you restore us? Lord, I thank you that you have promised to be faithful and just, to forgive us our sins. I thank you that whoever would call on your name will not be put to shame. Lord, that is a promise, and you keep your promises. Thank you. I ask all this in your son Jesus' name. Amen.